Hi, I'm Rebecca McKinnon, coming to you live from my exciting dining room table with my industrial strength headset because we sometimes have some ambient noise around the apartment. So I'm founding director of New America's Ranking Digital Rights Research Program, which we refer to as RDR for short. So if you hear people say RDR, you know what that means. And today we're publishing part two of a two-part report series that builds on more than five years of research about company policies and practices that affect their users' human rights. You can learn more about RDR and how we evaluate companies in our Corporate Accountability Index on our website at rankingdigitalrights.org. So um, the issue of social media content moderation, a little hot these days in the news, I would say. Um, the social impact of platforms, business models, the issue of what companies are doing to moderate or fact check or, or deal with uh, problematic content. Very hot. Uh, in the past 24 hours, a, a few news stories we've been seeing. Of course, Twitter famously has started putting fact check warnings on tweets about the election by the current occupant of the White House. Um, the Wall Street Journal has a blockbuster scoop about how Facebook commissioned research that found that its algorithms caused social polarization. And then Mark Zuckerberg chose to do nothing about it. Uh, there's also a report that you, you might not have noticed, but points to what happens when everybody says, companies should just use their automated technologies to take down bad stuff. Um, YouTube's content moderation algorithm has been found to be deleting comments critical of the Chinese government's propagandists online. And the company said that was a mistake of its AI. Whoops. So what are we going to do about all this? Today, we're gonna to drill down on the source of what is now widely known as the infodemic on top of the pandemic and what needs to be done to address it as we move into an especially fraught election season. We're gonna be joined in our discussion by a distinguished expert on the internet and civil liberties, Gaurav Laroya, a senior policy counsel for free press. But first, we're going to hear from our lead author of this report series, Natalie Marischal, already our senior policy analyst who's going to explain why and how the core driver of online misinformation and other dangerous content that has a negative social impact is uh, the social the, the the driver of of this problem is not just the content it's the company's targeted advertising business model take it away natalie tell us how that works You're muted, Natalie. Thanks so much for the reminder, Rebecca. Um, uh, thanks for the introduction, uh, Rebecca. So as, as Rebecca uh, it, uh, said, we have a real problem uh, with how social media and the uh, electronic uh, computerized algorithms that drive the distribution and the targeting of content uh, in this is, is changing our society. And uh, at this point, I think uh, civil society researchers and, ad and academics have helped us get a pretty sophisticated understanding of what's happening. Uh, but where, where we're still kind of stuck is at the policy level and what we should do about it. And both in the US and in, in other countries around the world, the focus has really been on how do we make sure that companies get rid of the bad content? And that's pretty much true regardless of how you define the bad content. So the problem with this line of argumentation is that, first of all, you have to agree what bad content is. There's some kinds of bad content where that's relatively straightforward uh, in the sense that everyone agrees that uh, images of children being sexually abused are unacceptable. And it's, uh, there's a fairly clear line between what that is and what that is not. But there's a lot of other types of problematic content uh, and even dangerous content where there's a lot more discussion. Uh, at what point uh, does satire uh, veer into hate speech? Uh, what, what point does, um, does hate speech, is hate speech political expression versus uh, a threat to somebody's, uh, to somebody's life or, uh, or, or well-being? Uh, what, can you tell the difference between somebody just being wrong in stating a fact versus spreading disinformation? So that's, that's a really huge definitional problem that um, is not really solvable at uh, the level of, uh, of, of a broad society, much less at the level of a planet. Um, but just as uh, difficult is the problem of how you actually detect 
whatever content is deemed to be bad under uh, the definition that you may have agreed to, uh, how you detect it, and how you and within what you do about it. Um, if we move on to the next slide, um, you'll, you'll, you'll see that uh, the, the core thesis of this report series is that uh, relying on revenue from targeted advertising incentivizes companies, whether it's Facebook, Twitter, YouTube, or a host of others, to design platforms that are addictive because they want to keep you online as long as possible so they can show you as many ads as possible, uh, manufacture virality, right? Because they want to be able to tell advertisers and other power users of their platforms that there are certain t uh, tips and tricks that they can employ to make sure that uh, their, their messages reach as wide an audience as possible. And they also want to maximize the information that they can collect about the users because the fact that they know so much about us uh, what what we do online, in what order we do those things, whether we do uh, we engage in certain online activities more reliably at certain times of day or when we're at home versus on the go or on different types of devices. Um, but also pairing this with all kinds of offline information, buying up our credit card records so that they can compare uh, our purchase history with what we did online the week before uh, and try to figure out which uh, types of ads are more effective at actually getting you to buy stuff. And they use all that data to uh, justify uh, to their advertisers uh, the money that they charge them uh, for this. So you end up in this uh, vicious cycle where uh, rather than thinking about uh, as many companies when they are first founded and aren't too worried about making money yet, they're just worried about getting um, as many users as possible. Uh, that's when you notice um, companies really thinking about what's, uh, what's fun for a user, what's useful, what's engaging, what's going to delight you. But as uh, the user, once they have the captured user base, uh, they lose the incentive to actually make people want to use the platform. And instead they figure out how to squeeze as much money out of you instead. And so that is what leads to uh, that. That is what leads to all of the social harms uh, that we're seeing today. Next slide, please. As a result of all this, social media platforms end up showing us a very distorted view of the world that is increasingly shaped by corporate algorithms and the people who know the tips and tricks to take advantage of them. And unlike in traditional media, you don't have a set, a, a, a ideally as diverse as possible, uh, set uh, of uh, professionals who have uh, training, who have judgment, who have uh, a certain uh, ethical responsibility to, uh, to, to truth, to accuracy, uh, to fairness, and to, uh, and to promote uh, uh, small d democratic and, and, and uh, civil, you know, civil liberties uh, compliant uh, values. In, in the news coverage. Instead, what, you're, what you have is a mathematical measure of popularity uh, that ends up surfacing what is most, um, what, what makes people most emotional, what gets people angry, what gets people upset, um, what makes people want to comment and get into flame wars on each other's, uh, on each other's pages and, and posts and, uh, and, and Twitter feeds. Uh, and none of that is good for uh, democracy and none of that is good for human rights. Next slide. So the reaction, as I was mentioning before, that a lot of policymakers have uh, around the world, but, but pr also right here in, in the US, is that what we need to do is uh, find ways to make companies better at taking down the bad content. So the problem with that is that first of all, in the US, we have this little thing called the First Amendment, uh, which means that governments can't prohibit speech. The government cannot tell platforms, this is what your rules should be outside of uh, some, some very narrow uh, circumstances, right? Uh, the, the, the images of uh, child abuse is, is, a, is a really clear example of that. Um, and what happens in countries that don't have uh, legislation or constitutional protections like uh, the First Amendment is that imposing what's called intermediary liability, so holding uh, platforms legally accountable for uh, the, the, the behaviors and, and speech of their users on the platform, uh, ends up resulting in unacceptable censorship. Because what you do in those cases is that you incentivize companies to be as cautious as possible and take down anything that anyone anywhere might dislike enough uh, to sue you. Because even if a lawsuit doesn't have merit, it's still a nuisance and many companies are going to be incentivized to just uh, be as cautious as possible and not let anything uh, remotely controversial onto the platforms. And we're seeing examples of this uh, in, in countries all around the world. 
Another challenge uh, to, uh, to this approach is that both government officials and tech executives have really been overselling the promise of algorithmic uh, content moderation, of, of using computers to uh, detect and take down uh, speech and, and other content that's against the rules. Uh, you know, if you, if you were to listen to uh, some of the things that uh, Mark Zuckerberg and Jack Dorsey and other tech executives have said over the past few years, uh, you would think that if we just nerd a little bit harder, we'll be able to come up with some magic AI that's just going to find all the bad stuff and take it down while also leaving all the bad stuff up. Um, and that's just not realistic for a lot of different reasons uh, that we can certainly go into as part of the Q&A. So, you know, we're, we've been very concerned along with many others in, uh, in the human rights and, uh, and civil rights community about uh, the, the risks that um, eliminating or drastically changing uh, Section 230 of the Communications Decency Act uh, would pose to freedom of the expression. And so, as Rebecca said, we've spent the past several years thinking about what uh, other interventions uh, would be that would uh, help address uh, these very real uh, problems associated with, uh, with dangerous and harmful content on the internet, but that strengthen freedom of expression and privacy rather than undermine them. Next slide. Um, actually, let's go on to the next slide. Thank you. Uh, so in, I'm going to talk about uh, a couple of our, uh, of our recommendations, and then uh, we'll, we'll take a pause to, get, uh, to give Gorov's take on our suggestions before going back to Rebecca, uh, who's a, who's a um, well-established expert on corporate governance when it comes to, uh, to human rights and, uh, and the public interest, and she's going to talk about that. Um, so the first thing that we uh, that we recommend is that we really need to understand uh, the the problems better at a, at a quantitative level. One of the really striking things about the Wall Street Journal scoop uh, that Rebecca mentioned is that um, the Facebook in particular knew years ago what all of us researchers on the outside have been saying for years, uh, which is that uh, the platform and the way that it's designed and optimized for virality and for targeted advertising uh, has been uh, ripping our society apart at the seams. Um, but the entire time that they knew this, based on their own internal research, they were poo-pooing all of us on the outside, saying that we were just making things up and that because we didn't have access to the same data that they did, we couldn't possibly have it right. Well, it turns out we did have it right, and they knew that, they just didn't like that fact. So to level the playing field and make sure that we're all working from the same uh, empirical set of facts, we really need a much better public understanding of how these platforms work on the outside. Um, so I won't read through uh, all the bullet points here. Uh, you can check out uh, the first report. Um, it's not just the content, it's the business model uh, for a longer discussion of, uh, of these uh, recommendations and exactly how they would help us uh, diagnose the problem and figure out what the right steps are to take about it. Next slide. Our second recommendation um, is to, also relates to, uh, to transparency. So back in 2017, uh, a bipartisan set of uh, senators first introduced the Honest Ads Act, which uh, has two main provisions. The first is to, um, um, to apply the same uh, transparency and you know, disclosure of, you know, this is a political ad paid for by this candidate or this political party uh, that already apply and have for a long time to print and broadcast ads, apply those same ads to uh, the internet. Now that to me seems like a no brainer. Uh, there's nothing special about the internet that should exclude you from having to be transparent about the fact that it's a political message and not something else. The second thing is, uh, is, a, is a transparency provision, which again, uh, mimics something that already exists for print and broadcast, but makes it possible for, uh, for regulators, for uh, journalists, for public interest advocates of all kinds, and for ordinary citizens for that matter, to see exactly what ads are being run who they're being targeted, right? So that we can see if, of course, if a politician is sending drastically different messages to uh, different uh, different groups of voters, um, and uh, and and also see who's paying for what and, and ensure compliance with both um, federal regulation, state regulation, but also companies' own rules. Um, one thing that so I you know so I think passing the Honest Ads Act is 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 a total no brainer and and really should have happened. Uh, a, a long time ago. We're, we're well, this is something that's well overdue. However, I also think it doesn't go far enough. Uh, and this is for two reasons. The first reason is that um, right now, um, 
self declare you know, uh, a number of the companies have uh, these uh, voluntary uh, online ad politi un political ad libraries. But the problem is that um, in order to be included in it, the advertiser has to voluntarily disclose that uh, in ad, that they're a political advertiser or that this is electioneering communications in some way. And it's really not at all clear that uh, if an advertiser were to um, lie and say that they're not a political ad, when in fact they are, uh, that they're actually getting caught. And anecdotally, I hear from uh, people in the uh, political ad buying business all the time that um, there is absolutely no, no, uh, no, um, no enforcement uh, factor there, that it's it's really just based on, on, on good faith. Uh, and that's just not enough. And then the second reason we need to expand uh, this transparency database to all types of ads is because political ads, uh, as defined by, uh, by, by law, are not the only types of communication that, uh, if abused, can be, uh, can be really harmful to the democratic process, to public health, and so on. You only have to look at the uh, misinformation and purposeful disinformation that's being spread uh, about the coronavirus pandemic uh, to see that uh, we really need uh, more insight and transparency into the communications that are going on, at the very least so that uh, existing laws can be enforced and so that um, we can uh, you know, have a conversation and uh, figure out what kind of targeted uh, public health communication need to be put in place to counter the harmful uh, misinformation and disinformation that's out there. Next slide. And then the third thing I want to talk about is a, a strong federal privacy law. Um, this may seem a little counterintuitive uh, at, at first, uh, but I actually think that uh, the best way to um, to address the problem of misinformation, disinformation, hate speech, uh, all those other kinds of problematic and, and harmful uh, content on the internet is actually, excuse me, a privacy law. Um, this is not about censorship. This is about limiting uh, the spread and reach of messages on the internet. And it's also about protecting privacy. You know, uh, among major, uh, major democracies, Americans actually have the fewest privacy rights uh, of, of any other uh, major democracy on earth. Um, that's not something to be proud of. That's something for us to fight for. And I think it's and I think uh, limiting uh, the the data that can be collected about people, uh, giving people strong control and access and deletion rights, um, making sure that abuses uh, abusive targeting like uh, the the case uh, last year where um, a bunch of advertisers were using Facebook's platform to target ads for housing and jobs in ways that excluded people based on their race, on their gender. Um, on their ethnicity and so on is, is completely unacceptable. And it's, um, you know, it's something that's, that's being litigated uh, and, uh, and, and discussed at various levels right now, uh, but it's not acceptable. And I, we should not be enabling a platform to, uh, to help advertisers uh, discriminate in this way. Um, here again, I'm not going to go into all the details uh, of what we're proposing, though, though certainly happy to answer questions, uh, but I would direct you to, uh, to our second report. Um, for that. Uh, and I'll stop here and turn it back over to Rebecca. Thanks very much, Natalie. Um, and uh, uh, Angela, if we could just move to the next slide just as, as our placeholder um, for a moment. And we're now going to go to Gaurav um, to, to respond uh, to what Natalie has said. Um, you are a you know prominent expert on um, civil, civil, civil liberties, civil rights, and the internet. Um, and in terms of your own work, what is, what is your perspective on how best to ensure that companies are operating in a way that actually um, upholds uh, citizens' rights? Um, yeah, so first, thanks, Rebecca and Natalie and the rest of the team at New America for having me on as part of this panel. And uh, Rebecca, you, my, the, the work I've been doing mostly is, is thinking about right, how data feeds this ecosystem and what that means for the business model, what that means for civil rights and, and how our society is, is organized and how these, these platforms interact with the way we, we connect and communicate with each other. I think that you're 100% um, right that, that the way that nothing about the choices about how the internet ecosystem works is, is natural or, or inevitable. These are distinct policy choices that people have made um, 
and and you guys are absolutely right and your report is 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 right to examine those choices and and evaluate if they're producing the kinds of rights respecting and humane outcomes that I think well, practically everyone on this on this call would like to see and and as you guys have so clearly laid out I mean the evidence is that they they haven't this business of massive data collection to support behavioral and targeted advertising has given these the bad actors the ability to further divide and spread hate misinformation led to an unfortunately vibrant ecosystem of data brokers surveillance capitalists and I think created an online system that you know in survey after survey Americans routinely characterize uh, with creepiness and mistrust uh, and so like Natalie just mentioned I actually do think uh, a strong privacy law could actually change much of that and make a real dent in how this ecosystem works and really affect those negative externalities that that you guys have so clearly laid out and you know I, I think that privacy law needs to have you know strong controls on permissible uses of personal information strong civil and human rights safeguards and effective enforcement so uh last year free press along with the lawyers committee for civil rights under law we, we published a model privacy bill that effectuated these these principles and our, and our guiding idea was that privacy rights are civil rights and any potential law must have anti-discrimination at its core and i think disparate impact analysis has largely been missing from the the conversation about regulation of of data and and you know this this the internet ecosystem i, I think fortunately organizations like rdr other members of the civil rights and human rights community have really spoken up and started educating people that you know facially neutral policies and programs even in the tech space you know further discrimination disenfranchisement and disadvantage already marginalized groups and that and that you know and those effects ripple out throughout society so, so i think in order to protect those civil rights people must have control over how their data is used um you know there have to be strong prohibitions and they can't be used to build systems that you know oppress discriminate and franchise and further segregate us as natalie mentioned that there are ongoing cases about about that and, you know and these aren't abstract harms you know there are definitely beneficial and harmless uses for information and some of these targeted mechanisms but you know as rebecca just mentioned there's um you know a, a bombshell wall street journal report that I, I hope many of you have read about how these are in fact deliberate choices that companies have made using the data that people have, really have no choice but to give up to them to even use their services that turn around and have you know these these huge negative impacts uh, and so when you when you think about a civil or human rights framework for how data is used it's it's i think really nothing new you know brick and mortar businesses have had to respect these core civil rights laws for over 50 years there is i think a pushback from many internet companies about well you know we exist in this new universe how can why do we have to respect laws or, or even that or even think about how are our, these systems that we've created can have these um can have these disparate impacts but really there shouldn't be any difference between the the you know rights respecting offline world the structure that exists there and the one that exists um that exists online right I, I think people should be able to make an understandable bargain with internet companies uh, when they hand their personal information over for a specific service. I mean, it's limiting the kinds of data people can collect. Companies should only be able to collect that information necessary to provide the service that people have asked for. I think the absence of these clear rules, right? This incredibly permissive business model um, has built a system that exploits people to maximize their own profits and with all the negative effects that we're seeing now. Um, I think just to just to, to close that idea up, I think fortunately, in both the House and the Senate, to bring back to uh, the political situation, we've seen these kinds of rights respecting proposals um, um, from both um, uh, members of the House and members of the Senate. And what they the, the best ones focus on how to protect people's rights, ending exploitative business models. And, and creating an enforcement mechanism that can actually go after these bad practices and, and end the exploitation of our information that feeds all of, right, all, all of the, the hated misinformation, voter disenfranchisement that, I, you know, that, we, that we actually don't have to live with.
Thank you, Gaurav. That's that's really great. So um, we're going to come back to more questions to you in, in a moment. I'm going to talk just briefly um, about um, one one of the things that you really touched upon, which is, you know, what's the point of a company? <laughs> um, you know, is is the purpose of capitalism an end in itself, or is it a, a means to an end for society? And even even the business roundtable, a business lobby group last summer, um, you know, came out with a statement recognizing the purpose of business is not just shareholder value; it's it's actually uh, bringing value to all stakeholders, right? And that means respecting that that means environmental sustainability. It also means having a sustainable society. Uh, in which people's rights are, are respected and protected, right? That's that's uh, you know part of adding value to all stakeholders, right? Keeping us alive and enabling that our rights and freedoms um, are are possible, <laughs> um, and uh, and and so which which gets to kind of a, a theme in our second report, where we we use this analogy really that initially came from the oil industry and then was adopted by the environmental movement and, and, and kind of more broadly, which is, you know, if you're going to deal with the downstream problems, you know, uh, you have to fix the upstream systems, right? And we talk about that a lot with pollution and so on, but it's the same with content. And, and so um, everybody's focused with, okay, how do we take down the bad content, the pollution? How do we clean up the pollution faster and put the onus on companies to do that? Yet we're not really talking to companies enough about what they need to change about their systems that's causing the spread and kind of weaponization and targeting of, of this type of content in the first place. And so um, if we could just go to the next slide, please. Um, one of the things, um, one of the uh, kind of sets of interventions that um, is actually, are, are actually a big focus of the broader business and human rights community, kind of outside of tech, and also a big focus of the environmental movement, really for the past couple decades, has been about getting companies to disclose information about their risks um, to the environment, their risks to society, so that the growing body of investors uh, who are concerned about actually wanting to invest in the types of companies that reflect their values and that are actually contributing positively to the environment and society as opposed to the opposite, so that such investors actually have the data and information they need to make decisions um, and also to hold accountable the, the, the company management of, of the uh, companies that they invest in. Um, and so there's a, a, a movement worldwide um, uh, and to, to get companies to disclose more what's known as environmental, social, and governance information. Um, and in the United States, there's no legal requirements to do so. In Europe, there's starting to be such legal requirements and also starting to be um, proposed laws in a number of countries uh, for and, and already enacted in France for something called due diligence, um, which is that companies need to actually conduct impact assessments, uh, not only on how their, their business is affecting the environment, uh, but also on, on its social impact and in, uh, identifying what the negative social impacts are and then demonstrating that they're working to mitigate and, and prevent the negative in, impacts. Now, we, you know, from that Wall Street Journal article, we saw that actually Facebook sort of did do a bit of an assessment or, around polarization and then did nothing about it. And, um, it, you know, so that is a problem. They should be doing impact assessments uh, about how their algorithms and their business model is affecting society. They should be demonstrating that they are doing these in a credible way. Uh, and then they should be demonstrating what they're doing to, to address that impact. Um, next slide, please. Um, one other final thing I, I want to talk about quickly is, um, you know, actually later today is um, is the uh, Facebook's annual shareholder meeting, um, and there are a number of shareholder proposals related to um, issues of disinformation and social harms caused by the platform, including one calling on the board to set up a human rights committee. And last year, there was a, a shareholder resolution calling for Mark Zuckerberg to step down 
uh, from being chairman of the board of directors, remain CEO, but no longer also be chair of, of directors, and for the appointment of an independent chair so that the management could actually be held accountable and there'd be more independent oversight over the company's social risks, including other risks. Um, and a majority of regular shareholders voted in favor of that, that proposal, but it didn't pass because Zuckerberg and insiders of the company own a special class of shares that are weighted 10% more than regular shares, and so they, they were able to vote it down, despite the fact that a majority of shareholders um, uh, uh, voted in favor of this. And this is just one example of how actually the, the Securities Exchange Commission could change the rules. They could require that companies phase out these kind of dual class uh, stock systems so that shareholders actually have the ability to hold the company accountable and require the company to, to address its problems in a, in a not disingenuous way. Um, and uh, next slide, please. Uh, so, you know, it's, that's one of our recommendations. You can see more details about that in the report. Um, but also there's another SEC rule that uh, the SEC has proposed changing. Um, and again, not to get into the details here, you can read about it in, in our report we just published today, but they're actually proposing a number of changes for how shareholders can file proposals to make it much harder uh, for for any of these proposals to be to be filed and to be voted on at shareholder meetings, which which then means again it's even harder for shareholders to put pressure uh, on corporate management to address their social impact. So uh, we'll go to the next slide, please. And so that's just to say, you know, this is a picture of a trawler, you know, the, the companies are trawling uh, around the internet uh, for people's information. This is then being used to target people. We're, we're seeing how, how the, that is causing content that might otherwise be obscure to travel far and wide across the internet and to hit the people who are, are to, 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 connect with the people who are most likely to be susceptible to that content, most likely to act on that content, to, to be inflamed by it. Um, and we need to do something uh, about that. It's, it's clear that the companies understand, um, uh, or certainly Facebook from that Wall Street Journal article, we know they understand the harm um, and, and they're not acting. Uh, and it is reasonable to, for society and for shareholders to demand that companies operate in a, man, in a manner that is actually sustainable for our society, that actually contributes to the kind of, of country we, we want to be living in, that ensures that our freedoms uh, are protected um, and, and that we're not just completely manipulated uh, by uh, opaque forces we, we can't see. Um, so next slide, please. That's that's it. Um, and we're going to go to our discussion. Um, these are the, the links to the report, but they're more accessible in the chat and, and also our website um, where you can find more information about our work. And I'm just going to hand it over now uh, back to our panelists. Um, uh, Gaurav, do you, do you think that uh, in the civil rights community, there's there's starting to be more um, focus on uh, kind of getting shareholders, bringing shareholders in as, as allies uh, to, to hold uh, companies accountable? Uh, yeah, I think there is definitely space and interest in that kind of activism. I mean, it's especially from the civil rights community and, and projects that, that Free Press has worked on um, um, that to force shareholders to hold companies accountable, especially for creating the, an environment of hate and divisiveness, which clearly are, as, as we know now even more than we did before, deliberate policy choices that you know, executives at those companies have chosen to do on purpose. And so this, this disempowerment of shareholders um, you know, because of you know, this, this uh, institution of basically corporate dictatorship by by CEOs, it just shows how problematic that is. And it should be no surprise it's problematic when it comes to our political governance. Why would it not be problematic when it comes to, to business and corporate governance? 
Right. And, and so, uh, Natalie, do, um, in, in terms of um, some of the news that's been coming out uh, in, in the past couple days, um, and uh, all this uh, uh, kind of controversy, um, not just about Facebook, but uh, about what Twitter is and isn't doing, uh, you know, uh, YouTube's algorithms, um, uh, what, what do you think um, you know what? What what do you think the companies should be doing right now, like regardless of of regulation? Right. So one key problem that I see that has been feeding a lot of these controversies is that uh, the companies have had rules uh, that are rules that they that they made in consultation with uh, a number of stakeholders, including uh, civil society organizations, uh, and that they're entitled uh, in the U.S. Uh, to to make. Uh, to make their own rules uh, on, under Section 230, uh, but they've been applying them uh, very inconsistently. And so I think, uh, you know, one of the things that's come up in the past few days is uh, Twitter's decision to uh, put uh, fact check labels on uh, some of uh, President Trump's uh, tweets about the electoral process. These are rules that uh, Twitter has had in place uh, for some time now that, uh, that they will uh, put a fact check label and correct um, information that is factually incorrect uh, about how voting actually works. The problem is that they have uh, not chosen to uh, to actually enforce that when it comes to uh, to certain political leaders. And I think the fact that they're actually enforcing these rules that they've had on the books for some time now is, is a positive thing, because if you're going to have rules, you should enforce them in a transparent and fair manner. And you should also provide uh, appeal mechanisms, right? Because sometimes companies will make the wrong call. Uh, though I don't think that's the case in this particular instance. Um, and I think what we're seeing now is a kind of uh, shock and dismay that uh, politicians and, and, and powerful people are being held to the same standards as everybody else. Yeah, and, and the, the, the other thing too, I mean, one of the things we point out in the report um, is that, you know, this, the infodemic with the pandemic has been deadly. Um, but uh, if misinformation about how to vote, where to vote, when to vote, what actually happened uh, at, at polling places, um, if, if that could that could kill democracy, right? That that could result in um, a, a, a sort of a disaster for for the democratic process um and and so one of the things we've called for in the report is you know given that it's pretty unlikely that congress is going to be able to enact all the things we're calling for in the next two months uh in time to have have an impact for the election that companies really need to step up and curb the the mechanisms that are enabling misinformation to travel and to be so effective in its targeting um, uh, uh, and, and also curb the way in which people can be targeted, the way in which data is collected and, and, and so on. And I wonder, Gaurav, if, if, if you might comment, comment on that as well in terms of what you think companies need to be doing now. Oh, yeah, sure. So when it comes to, you know, let's say, let's talk specifically about the election. I, I think you're right. There are, this is, shows you how important outside of regulation, a lot of activism is projects that, that New America have done, uh, Free Press and others have a project called Change the Terms, which, which has addressed some of these issues as well, which is that the companies have it in their power to, 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 to you know, turn this switch on and off tomorrow. And, and I do think they have a social responsibility, whether or not that's enshrined in regulation, which I, I do hope, you know, we, we get to a, a point legally where we can start talking about that. But, but I think as, as, you know, participants in this society and hopefully stake, stakeholders that believe in the democratic process, yes, misinformation about the time, place, and manner of the vote uh, to protect people's franchise really actually doesn't implicate that many speech issues. And, and on the other side, has such an important part in protecting people's hard fought right um, to vote, that it's, it's, it's really incumbent on them to embrace and, and accept the fact that they have a responsibility here to protect democracy. Great. Well, we're getting a lot of good questions coming in. So I think, I think we're going to, I'm just going to, you know, uh, 
use my moderator's privilege to, to start pulling in some questions we've been get, getting, um, and we can mix it up with some other follow-ons and, and so on. Um, but uh, one question we got from, from Adam uh, on Zoom, um, and, and maybe Natalie, you could take the, the first crack at this, because I, I know you've written about it both in, in part one of this report series and, and elsewhere, is have you seen state actors like China and Russia and other perpetrators actively exploiting social media's business models to amplify their disinformation campaign? Absolutely. And that's something that's been well documented by uh, a host of, uh, of organizations uh, and, and, and researchers from civil society and academia, as well as, as government. You know, I mean, it's, uh, it's been well documented that um, the Russian Internet Research Agency uh, used uh, not only targeted advertising, uh, famously paid for, infamously paid for in rubles, uh, to uh, target ads uh, to uh, discourage uh, African voters, African American voters in particular, uh, from voting in the 2016 election. Uh, but they also have uh, displayed a very savvy understanding of how uh, groups work, uh, how um, how recommendations uh, for joining groups work, how, what kinds of content uh, gets boosted by, uh, by the newsfeed and, uh, and Twitter timeline algorithms. Uh, China has also been very active in this space, uh, as has Iran uh, and, and a host of other uh, state actors. So that's, that's absolutely indisputable at this point. And, and actually to follow up on that, um, uh, a number of, of people have have pointed out, uh, and and I think uh, I, actually um, uh, Sam Sachs, who's who's a fellow with New America, just pointed this out uh, this week, that uh, a strong national data privacy law is actually a national security imperative, in in part for that reason, among many others. Yeah, I completely agree. If it weren't for the data that uh, that the that the the platforms have uh, have access to, and that they even if they don't actually transfer the data, uh, as well, that did happen in the Cambridge Analytical scandal as, as well as other instances. But even if we take them at their word that this is no longer happening at all, they still lend the capabilities, uh, or rather rent out the capabilities uh, that they have thanks to that data to target people, as you said, to uh, to allow advertising and other kind of influence operations to reach precisely the people who uh, have been mathematically calculated to be the most likely to be susceptible uh, to those messages. So if you if you take away that uh, th this this huge uh, security flaw, uh, that means that in order to persuade people, you actually will have to be persuasive uh, in a way that's much more robust and um, um, and, and open to scrutiny uh, than uh, the current uh, opaque and unaccountable system that we're living under. Yeah. Grab, yeah, what do you I mean, think? We, well, we, you know, we don't have to, as Natalie said, we don't have to look any further than the Senate Intelligence Committee's report on interference in the 2016 election to see laid out in, in very clear terms that, yes, these systems are open to exploitation of this kind in a way that subverts democracy. And so, of course, we should be incredibly, incredibly worried about that. One of the other, I guess, really problematic parts of this is not only have, have a lot of these companies created systems so open to exploitation, but because attention and divisiveness gets eyeballs, they are also profiting off of, you know, what is the erosion of all these norms in our democracy. And it, that situation, it really just can't stand. And that's why I, I do think it's great that we're talking about how the business model can change to disincentivize like this, this, what exists right now, an incentive to, to create division for profit that undermines, you know, our, you know, our society. Yeah. So, something, so something yeah, go ahead. I, yeah. Something else that I'd like to add is that um, companies, um, you know, have this line uh, that, that, that they invented, that they've drawn between uh, advertising, which is okay. And, uh, you know, to, if you take them at their word, even beneficial for, uh, for, for all of us. And then you have uh, inauthentic coordinated behavior. And it is, and to me, that's really a, diff a very subjective difference right? Because what is an advertising campaign if not behavior that is both inauthentic and also coordinated, 
right? That doesn't mean that it's all harmful, right? Like I don't really, you know, I don't have a problem with uh, traditional advertisers, um, you know, trying to get it to increase the market share for uh, their detergent or their sneakers or uh, their vacation packages, right? But, you know, the, there's a, there's a, the, the line between, uh, you know, pure commercial advertising, issue advertising, political advertising, um, and an out and out uh, propaganda or disinformation effort is not that clear. And uh, that's something that the companies are really invested in, help in making us believe that there really is such a line. Uh, and also that they are the right people to uh, decide, decide where it is and enforce that line and if you're going to optimize a platform for uh you know the good type of coordinated and authentic behavior uh marketing um there is no reason whatsoever to believe that it's not going to be equally um useful and beneficial uh for the more nefarious types of disinformation uh, that we're so concerned about so what if uh the companies you know twitter facebook and youtube anyway um all agreed to moratorium on all targeted advertising between now and the election and just just only allowed contextual advertising or targeting by geogra geography only and nothing else um what how how would uh things be different and you know other than a lot of revenue being lost uh what what might any other negative consequences be yeah. Well, first of all, I'm not that convinced that that much revenue would be lost. You know, if you look at the some of the major commercial uh, brands and, and, and co companies that own multiple brands, I'm talking about the, the Unilevers, the Nestle's, and, and so forth. Um, they've been increasingly pulling their uh, their marketing budgets out of targeted advertising, certainly out of micro-targeted advertising, because they're just not finding it that useful. You know, um, there, there, you know, certainly things like showing people ads in the language that they actually understand uh, is very important. Uh, broad geographic uh, and sometimes, you know, even to the level of a, of, of a city is uh, is very useful, right? If you're doing a sale in one area or you're a local business, you're not going to advertise to people at the other end of the country. Um, but most brands are actually not finding uh, micro-targeting to be all that useful for those kinds of products. Uh, the campaigns that do find it useful are exactly the ones who are trying to exploit um, pre-existing divisions in society or to uh, turn people against each other to send different messages uh, to different people. And uh, I, I do think that uh, a moratorium on that kind of targeting uh, would be a, a really prudent thing to do uh, in advance of the election. And then based on the data that, that is collected uh, dur during that type uh, by seeing how the platform, uh, the platform's users change their behavior, uh, that'll give us a really, really uh, useful way to make decisions about uh, how to move forward from there. I, mean, I, think, yeah, I, I think this is where your recommendations and, and recommendations that emphasize transparency are so important. There, I mean, there are trade-offs when it comes to, to, to putting the brakes on targeted political advertising, right? If I'm, if I'm trying to reach people that are interested in, in Black Lives Matter in a locality that is, that is let's say, overwhelmingly white or has, has you know, a attitudes that are antithetical to that movement, I may want to have some sort of more precise targeting. The only way to figure out whether that trade-off makes sense, and I think it may well make, make sense, is, is we have to have really robust disclosures of who is spending this money, where, where is, who is being targeted, what are the kind of messages that are being targeted, and to whom. I, I you know, want to be able to go to these companies and say, you know, we've looked at the evidence on balance, this is actually a socially destructive force, and, and also go to, you know, uh, allies in all the movements that, that I'm a part of and say, there is there is a trade-off here, and we have to be aware of, of, of what that is, and that's just not possible unless we force some serious disclosures on, on from these companies. Cool. Well, I, I want to thank everybody who's been posting questions, because we've got so many fantastic questions. I wish we could go for another hour just with everybody's questions, but uh, we've got about nine minutes, so I'll, I'll get to as, as many more as, as I can. Um, the, the next question from Veronica, uh, also in Zoom, uh, asks, uh, do you think increased oversight could adversely affect online social justice organizing work? And I think maybe increased oversight, she, she may mean uh, content moderation, perhaps. Uh, um, 
uh, I, I'm, it, oversight can mean many things, and I'm guessing uh, at interpreting her question. But um, Gaurav, what what do you think about that? Yeah, uh, right. There, there's a strain of thinking that we can't ask for nice things because giant companies are never going to have our interests in mind. And I, I do think, that not necessarily that's what this, this person asked, but I've, I've heard that flavor of, of comment. And I think we just have to ask that, that companies act in socially responsible ways. Obviously, they are reticent to do so. We've talked about this article a million times already. But, you know, evidence piles on and on and on that they, they do not want to act in socially responsible ways. It does not mean at all that we should not ask that they do so and, you know, demand the kinds of reports from them, assessments from them showing that, you know, uh, why they've made the decisions they've made and, and to, to force socially beneficial outcomes. So, no, I'm not afraid of, of increased oversight. Yeah. I'm going to move on to the next question, um, even though I know Natalie will also have useful things to say on this, just in the, in, in the interest of respecting all these great questions that we've got. And also, I think both of you will have interesting things to say about this next question, uh, which comes from uh, Monica via Zoom. Um, what are the odds that a federal privacy law makes it through this or the next Congress? What needs to happen to change the odds? Do you want to go first, Natalie, or should I go first? Sure, I can go first. I mean, I think I think it's extremely unlikely that uh, the majority House Democrats and the majority uh, Senate Republicans uh, are going to come to uh, an agreement on a federal privacy bill uh, between now and November. Um, and if you add the the odds that President Trump would also sign such a bill, uh, I think that put us that puts us uh, in the well into the realm of the unlikely. Um, that being said, uh, that doesn't mean that it's not worth uh, talking about and discussing now. Um, None of us know what uh, the next Congress will look like, or indeed who will be in the White House uh, next year. Uh, and you know, legislation doesn't happen overnight. Uh, now is the time to be having these conversations uh, with uh, with members of both parties, uh, as well as people who may not, you know, identify with either party for that matter, uh, about uh, about what a, a federal privacy bill uh, that would actually protect privacy and uh, and, and operate in the threat in the public interest would look like. Yeah, I, I think the likelihood of, of privacy legislation getting passed, this Congress obviously isn't, isn't that high, but it's also not super great for some very good reasons. The, the human rights and civil rights community has started demanding that civil rights protections be in any privacy bill, that ro there needs to be robust enforcement with, with forward-looking rulemaking power that can look at data practices and decide whether they're permissible or not. That is something a lot of people on the Hill disagree with. It is, it is perhaps a, a different kind of emphasis than what privacy has looked like in, in, the, in preceding years that does make the boulder a little harder to, to roll up the Hill. But I'm, I'm confident it's the right approach and, and that we will, we will get there. Cool. Um, we have a uh, question from Sophie Pilgrim. Is Facebook's oversight board a step in the right direction in terms of content governance? Um, I will venture a, a, a quick response of my own and, and, and uh, I'd like to, to know what, what our guest Gaurav thinks in particular. Um, uh, you know, it, it may help deal with, I mean, the, the remit of the oversight board is very narrow in that its mandate is just to adjudicate specific decisions about whether to whether specific content stays or goes so their mandate while they could you know they could they're welcome to issue opinions on anything else but but uh, Mark Zuckerberg and and Facebook management are under no obligation to even listen to or pay attention to any other opinions that the oversight more board might issue around, let's say, their algorithms and, and the impact of their algorithms on social division or the targeted advertising business model and its effect on content, et cetera. And this is where, you know, oversight is supposed to, traditionally with corporate governance, oversight, th there's a body that's supposed to oversee management 
to make sure it's handling its risks uh, and its social impact, environmental impact, and all those things. It's called the board of directors, and the board of directors is completely failing because it's, you know, the people who've been more critical of Zuckerberg have been eased out lately, and 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 it's it's full of people who who mainly agree with him and and support his his way of doing things, um, and uh, shareholders uh, can't force a, a change in that regard because of the, the voting structure. Um, and so now we have this oversight board that's kind of helping, you know, if, if Facebook has to make tough decisions about, oh, a particular politician's content is a statement on Facebook uh, goes against the rules and they take it down and Facebook sort of, uh, the oversight board, I think, helps to reinforce and give sort of moral authority and legitimacy to the tough particularly, I think, politically tough decisions about content moderation that Facebook might want to make but is kind of afraid to make. Um, but it's not going to deal with any of these other broader issues as it's currently constructed. But uh, Gaurav, I'm sort of curious to your, your thoughts. Yeah, I mean, I, I agree. There's been a very odd, from my perspective, hype about what the Oversight Board is and is supposed to do. It, it, it has been thought of as, right, like, you, uh, this is this is it. This is going to be an oversight for how Facebook's content policies work. That's that's not true at, at all. It's, it is going to adjudicate a very narrow slice over a very long adjudication time, a, a very small slice of cases. The the fact is policy at Facebook is going to is going to still reside at Facebook and at the top, as, as Rebecca said. Um, and so, uh, you know, I, I think it is you know, worth looking at with an, with an open mind. I am skeptical it is going to live up to the hype that surrounds it. And, you know, personally for me, and I'm, I'm sure my colleagues at Free Press, we will retain our laser focus on, you know, the directors and board and policy team at Facebook to, to try to get that company to follow, you know, the recommendations that all organizations are asking for it to do. Yeah, the only thing I would add to, uh, to, to all that is that uh, I think it really serves Facebook's interests very well to keep the conversation at the level of content and content governance, uh, because this is one of those wicked problems that is uh, not fixable, right? We're, we could keep arguing for uh, decades and centuries and even millennia about uh, the lines for content, about how to enforce it, about precedent, about context and all that, and never actually get anywhere. And Facebook is happy to throw resources at having this conversation, just as long as it keeps everybody else focused on this and not talk about the fundamental problems and changing the upstream causes of, these, uh, of, of, this, um, of this infodemic, uh, which is exactly what we're calling for uh, in this report series. Okay, well, my clock is saying 1230 on the dot. So we're about to turn into pumpkins here. Any final burning things that uh, either of you need to say that I failed to ask you about? I'll just I'll just jump in and say, well, once again, thanks for having us on. Hugely agree. The business model here is a massive problem. And the more um, the civil rights community, the human rights community, and, and people interested in this topic actually investigate the, the business model, and, and that's a place where we can actually make legal and regulatory interventions, we can actually you know, move the ball forward on, on getting an internet ecosystem that respects civil and human rights. Well, thank you very much, Garav. We're going to give you the last word there as our guest, as appropriate. And just thanks so much to everybody who joined us today. I see we have well over 100 uh, people at the moment. There pro we're probably more at the peak. And uh, this has been a great conversation. Um, we look forward to having more of these uh, on Twitter and uh, everywhere else. Um, online and maybe someday even in person again. We'll see. Thank you so much, everyone. Thanks, everyone.